House is dedicated to promoting reading success for all. We attack illiteracy from three angles. We give teachers evidence-based strategies to teach reading. We provide parents of struggling readers with support and information. And we teach adults to read. Giving the kids the Nye House strategies and letting them know that they can compete with anyone, that's our passion. I know that the work that my teachers are investing in daily is working and it's having a greater impact, not just on the students themselves, but with their families, with our community, with our city. Hello. My name is Katherine Scott, and welcome to A Parent's Guide to Structured Literacy Decoding. Today, I'm going to be talking about one component of what research suggests should be included in every reading instructional program for primary students, phonology and phonics. So let's get started with some background about the research into reading development and reading instruction. When we talk about the science behind research, it means that it's just simply a systematically organized body of knowledge on a particular subject. Now, the science of reading is a collective body of interdisciplinary research that comes from multiple different fields of study, such as developmental psychology, cognitive neuropsychology, developmental linguistics, educational intervention. This systematically organized body of knowledge about reading is from over 40 years of research that found consistent findings on how one learns to read and how to teach reading. From the data into reading development and instructional practices came guiding principles about how to teach reading that has the most impact and success at producing skilled readers. This type of instruction is called structured literacy. Now, structured literacy is defined as a reading lesson that explicitly teaches systematic word identification or decoding strategies. There are over one million words in the English language, and therefore we need a strategy to help read words that we've never seen or heard before. Now, part of the goal of structured literacy is to teach effective decoding strategies to help read unfamiliar words. And when we teach students about how to identify reliable patterns of the structure of the English language, we're in essence providing them with a reliable strategy for word identification. Now, structured literacy instruction includes all the components that a skilled reader does when they're reading. Think about it. When you're learning how to read, it's important to know the sounds of the language, which is phonology. It's also important to know what symbols are used to represent those sounds, which is the sound symbol association. The syllable types help determine what the vowel sound is going to say in a word. And then how those words are put together and what those parts mean, that's called morphology. How words are structured to form a sentence, which relates to grammar or syntax. And finally, semantics, which is essentially the meaning of words. Now, those are the components of what should be part of a structured literacy lesson. An effective lesson should also include these characteristics. That Instruction should be explicit, that skills are directly taught. We don't assume that language skills are just going to develop simply by having students reading. Instruction should also be systematic and cumulative. So there's a plan to it. Concepts are systematic because they're taught from the simplest to the most difficult, and cumulative because every concept builds on previously taught concepts. Instruction should be evidence-based. It's based on research that has demonstrated its efficacy. It's not just because we want to do it or how we always do it in the classroom. It has evidence behind it. And once concepts are introduced, they're sustained practice, so students can build automaticity. Previously taught concepts are systematically reviewed to strengthen memory, and then you have progress monitoring. You want to ensure that students are understanding and able to apply the things that they've learned. The goal of Structured Literacy Association is to take the guesswork out of learning how to read. 
all students, not just struggling readers, benefit from explicit instruction in phonics, which, as I mentioned earlier, teaches students a reliable strategy to decode words. Explicitly teaching phonics in the early grades has significant positive impacts on learning how to read. As stated by the National Council on Literacy, students in kindergarten and first grade who received systematic and explicit phonics instruction were better at reading and spelling words than kindergartners and first graders who did not receive the same instruction. Students who are taught phonics in a systematic and explicit way also have better reading comprehension because they're able to read words in the text accurately and rapidly, which frees up their cognitive resources to devote to deriving meaning from words and text. So structured literacy is about reading, but what exactly is reading? How is reading even defined? What makes someone skilled at reading? So this is one definition of reading. Reading is an interactive process in which the reader instantly translates symbols into sounds to form words, which is decoding, and connects the words to meaning, which is comprehension. For example, I want you to read this word. Now, what did you do to read it? When you read, you're doing several things at once. For one thing, you recognize the letters, right? D-O-G. And you understand what these letters represent. D, A, G. And then you can blend those sounds together to form a single word, D, A, G. And then you attach a meaning to that word. And this is all done without conscious effort. And of course, you're doing all of these things in milliseconds. So let's look at reading this way. When we're talking about decoding, decoding is recognizing and pronouncing words fluently with no effort. And when you read that word dog instantly, all of your attention is focused on the meaning and not trying to figure out how to read that word. That's the importance of skilled decoding. Now, language comprehension makes sense of what you've read. As quickly as you read that word dog, you didn't think about the letters and the sounds in the word. You probably just pictured some type of canine. That's the importance of skilled language comprehension. When you can read all the words on a printed page effortlessly and quickly attach meaning to them, you're gaining new information from and even just being entertained by what's on the page. That's skilled reading comprehension, which is the reason for reading. You can look at it like a mathematical product equation. Decoding times language comprehension equals reading comprehension, which is the simple view of reading which was first proposed by Goff and Tubner. So now if we synthesize all of this information that we just discussed, when you think about the characteristics of skilled reading, it should be accurate, meaning that a reader can read words without error. It should also be automatic, so words are built into instant memory, meaning that you are instantly reading words without pausing. Reading should also be fluent, so words are read without conscious thought, and the reading is smooth and fluid. And of course, a reader understands what the words mean. This is the ultimate goal of reading instruction, comprehension. So how does a reader become accurate, fluent, and able to comprehend the meaning of words? So underpinning decoding and language comprehension are key foundational skills. And we're going to look at this from a skilled reader's perspective. So skilled readers have instant word recognition. And this is the goal of decoding, that every word can be read instantly, accurately, and automatically without stopping to think about what the word is. But when skilled readers run into an unfamiliar word, they apply what they know about the alphabetic principle, how sounds map onto the symbols to decode a word. For longer words, skilled readers are also able to look at the structure of whole words, chunking them into smaller parts, like finding suffixes, prefixes, roots, or even syllables. And as a last resort, skilled readers use context to guess a word. Now, the bridge between decoding and language comprehension is fluency. And the important aspect about fluency is that it's automatic and does not require the reader to slow down or does not require valuable cognitive resources. For the purposes of this lecture, we're going to be discussing decoding and its foundational skills. So let's think about the goal of decoding, which is 
instant word recognition. So here's a perfect illustration of instant word recognition. I'm going to show you a word, but I don't want you to read it. Are you ready? Just look at it. Be honest. How many of you read the word? You can't help but read it. This is what instant word recognition is. The reader can't help but read the word because it's held in your memory. Without instant word recognition, students' reading is slow and choppy, and their attention is directed at decoding words instead of directed at understanding meaning. We want all words to be held in memory for instant word recognition. Therefore, struggling readers need to have repeated exposures to words and patterns. It's important for them to overlearn the patterns of language to help them have that instant recall. I want you to consider this analogy. Imagine driving down a winding road on a beautiful sunny day. Now imagine that you're driving down that same road on a rainy day. You have to slow down and concentrate more on that rainy day. And struggling readers have to concentrate at the word level all along the way. So instant word recognition is built through two ways, through repeated exposures to a word and through thorough knowledge of the sound symbol correspondences. So instant word recognition, though, requires a solid foundation of sound symbol correspondence. Now, reading involves a very complex set of skills. We're not born with the innate ability to read and write like we are born with a natural ability to use oral language, which is speaking and listening. Reading and writing is an invention of humans. Symbols are used to represent written language are completely arbitrary. There are many different kinds of symbols that represent many different kinds of sounds in different languages. Now, I want you to read some words from me that have the short A and the short I sound. So let's practice these sounds first. Okay, so short A says ah, and short I says i. Okay, ready? I want you to read these words out loud. Hmm. We just practiced the short A and the short I. Why are you having problems? Maybe you're having problems with some of these sound symbol correspondences. So first, let's review the ampersand. So ampersand is pronounced k. So the first word is cat. Asterisk is pronounced k. So the second word is skip. How is the ampersand pronounced? K. And the asterisk is k. So ready? Read these words out loud. I bet you are much faster in reading these words. Why? Because you know how to match the sounds and symbols. So you're, you're able to accurately and correctly read those words. Ready? I'm going to show you another row. Read these words. I bet you're able to read those words even faster. Why? Because not only do you know the sound symbol correspondences, that improved your automaticity, your instant memory, and in reading words with these particular patterns. So explicit instruction or direct instruction of sound symbol correspondences aids the accuracy and the automaticity of reading. And that helps build instant word recognition. Sound symbol correspondences give readers a strategy for reading unfamiliar words by sounding out the word. And when you're teaching sound symbol correspondences, you're teaching phonics. So before we delve into any deeper into phonics and sound symbol correspondences, let's pause for a moment and clarify some fun terms. So even though phonology and phonics sound very similar and they both contain the Greek morpheme phono, which means sound, these two terms are not synonymous. Phonology and phonics are two separate skills that are both necessary to learn how to decode words. Now, phonics is the instructional method of teaching reading and spelling by matching the sounds in speech to the appropriate symbols that represent specific speech sounds. Phonics is at the print level, but there's an oral and a written part to phonics, the oral being the sounds and the print being the symbols that represent those sounds. Phonology is the study of speech sounds and the rules that govern speech sounds in a language. Every spoken language has a system of rules that govern how the sounds and sound patterns are spoken out loud. Phonology and its related skills are entirely at the OR level. There is no print associated with them. Yet phonology, as you're going to see, is very important when it comes to phonics. 
Now, phonological awareness is the awareness of the units of speech at the word level, at the syllable level, and the sound level. So let's talk a minute about phonological awareness and phonemic awareness. Again, these two terms are not synonymous. Phonological awareness is the broad understanding of the structure of the language, while phonemic awareness is just one component, just one aspect of um, phonological awareness. Phonemic awareness is the ability to detect, identify, and manipulate phonemes in spoken words. A phoneme is a single speech sound. A phoneme is the smallest unit of spoken language that makes a difference in the pronunciation and the meaning of a word. For example, take the word cat. Now change the k to s. The word is now sat. Now when we change the sounds in the word, you change the pronunciation and you also change the meaning of the word. So to take advantage of the sound symbol correspondences, students need to have those two foundational skills in place, phonemic awareness and instant letter recognition. Again, phonemes are those individual speech sounds in language, and the ability to detect, identify, and manipulate phonemes in spoken language is very important to reading. Phonemic awareness activities are all sound tasks, meaning that you could do these in the dark there's no print at all that's involved with them. So segmenting speech sounds is a key skill in learning how to decode and spell. When you spell a word, you're taking that word apart into its separate speech sounds or segmenting the word. For example, the word dog can be segmented into three speech sounds, d, a, g. Now blending is a necessary skill for decoding. To read or say a word, you need to be able to blend those individual sounds together. Blending is a more difficult skill, a difficult phonemic awareness skill. And to help students who struggle with blending, the teacher can focus on the onset and the rhyme of a word. For example, if I say this sound, mmm, and then at, if I move it closer and say it faster, mat. Another strategy for blending is this. This much says, ma, this says, t. If I move it closer, say it faster, mat. Now, if we look at changing sounds, which is a more challenging phonemic awareness activity, that's manipulating sounds. If we say mat and we change the initial sound, m, to b, to make bat, or we might change the medial sound, a, to i, to make it say bit, or the final sound if we change t to l, and now we make it say bill. Omitting sounds creates a new word by omitting a sound from either the initial or the final position. For example, say snow. Now take away the s and you have no. Did anybody think now? That's because you have that print mapped into your brain. Now say light. Now take away the t and you have lie. That's omitting. Phonemic awareness is a skill that not every person can easily do. Some children are more successful than others at being able to discriminate different speech sounds. But it is a skill that can be taught. Phonemes are very challenging to identify, and they require very specific attention to how words are articulated. And running speech and sentences or sounds and words, a lot of times they're blended together, so the detection of each distinct word or sound is not easy, especially for young early readers. The crucial roles of phonological and phonemic awareness on learning how to read accurately and automatically has been strongly supported by research. Strong phonemic awareness skills is an important factor in determining how easily young children will learn how to read. Research studies show that there's a strong correlation between a child's phonemic awareness skills and their early reading skills. Students who have strong instruction and phonemic awareness constantly and consistently outperform other students who do not have phonemic awareness throughout multiple grade levels. The National Reading Panel reported on the importance of phonemic awareness. Now, phonemic awareness improves students' word reading and reading comprehension and also teaches students how to spell. So let's talk about that other foundational skill, instant letter recognition. So let's do some more terminology. So what's a letter? A letter is just a symbol and it can represent a speech sound. However, when we're teaching how to decode or phonics, we're teaching letter patterns or graphemes. 
A grapheme is a term for a letter or a group of letters that represent specific sounds or phonemes. For example, if we have light and we were to unblend that, light, it has three phonemes. But how many letters does it have? Five, right? L-I-G-H-T. But there are three graphemes that represent the three sounds or phonemes and light. For example, the sound for ul is represented by L. The sound for I is represented by three letters, I-G-H, and the sound for T is represented by the letter T. So take a minute to think about what is the difference between a phoneme, a letter, and a grapheme. Okay, did you come up with this? Phonemes are individual speech sounds blended together to make a word. A letter is a symbol, but a grapheme is more specific. A grapheme represents a specific sound or phoneme. A grapheme can be a single letter or a group of letters. So let's look at another example, just to make sure that we understand the difference between these three terms. So you have the word street. The word street has six letters, S-T-R-E-E-T. -E -E now, if we break it up to phonemes and graphemes, let's think about it. So the sound of s is represented by the grapheme s. The sound of t is represented by the letter t. The sound of er is represented by the letter r. The sound of e is represented by the vowel digraph ee. -E. So you have two e's that are counting as one grapheme. And the sound t is, representing the letter, is represented by the letter t. So let's talk a minute about this. So when we're counting phonemes, what are we doing? We're counting the individual sounds detected in words or syllables. So sounds blend together, like bull, that begins the word blend. This blend has two letters, and we can detect each single phoneme and the blend, b, u. Each letter in the blend represents an individual phoneme. Blends mean you can unblend the sounds. Now, there are some groups of letters that you cannot segment like this. These are called digraphs or trigraphs. Digraphs like CK, SH, and EA, they each contain two letters that represent one phoneme, or even the trigraph TCH, which represents one sound or one phoneme. This means I can't break it apart. If you think, for example, the letters SH, it represents the sound SH. I can't break that apart. So a digraph are two letters that represent one phoneme, but a blend are two individual phonemes coming together to represent two individual speech sounds. It's important to teach blends, but it's also important for students to understand that they can unblend blends. So, in order to take advantage of sound symbol correspondences, again, students have to have those two foundational skills in place, phonemic awareness and instant letter recognition. Again, phonemic awareness is that understanding that spoken words like cat are made up of individual speech sounds like k, at. And then with instant letter recognition, students are able to quickly recognize letters, which helps them learning to quickly associate those letters and sounds. So when students can detect the individual speech sounds and words and they can quickly recognize letters, now they're ready to establish the alphabetic principle. And that's the idea that sounds and spoken words can be mapped onto or represented by letters and printed words. So once students have acquired the alphabetic principle, they're ready to start thinking about how words are put together or the structure of language. So we talked earlier about the importance of teaching sound symbol correspondences explicitly. However, we know that vowels can have more than one sound, so how does a reader know if the A is going to be long or if that A is going to be short or even have an unexpected sound? So what we can do, we can categorize most of the syllables used in the English language into six types. Closed, open, vowel consonant E, vowel pair, vowel R, and final stable. Now, syllable types are based on the patterns of consonants and vowels within the syllable. And knowing which syllable type a word is is going to help with decoding a word. And because the reader can better determine the sound of the vowel, that enables them to then have a very reliable pattern for being able to decode the word. 
And this lecture, we're only going to be going over three out of the six syllable types. So what am I even talking about when I'm talking about syllables? So I'm sure most of us grew up counting syllables with either clapping them out loud, tapping them, but what are you actually doing when you're clapping syllables or tapping out how many syllables? So a syllable can be a word or it could just be part of a word. Every syllable though has one vowel sound. And what a vowel sound does is it opens your mouth while consonant sounds close your mouth. Every syllable opens your mouth and without vowels, it would be really hard to understand what we were saying to each other. So when you're counting syllables, you're actually counting sounded vowel sounds. So let's try listening for syllables with names. So one way to count syllables, because sometimes it can be kind of hard and challenging for um, some young learners to count syllables, you can put your hand underneath your chin to count how many times your mouth opens. So let's try some, some names and count how many syllables there are in each name. For example, if I say Ben, John, Tom, how many times did your mouth move? once, right? So that means that there's only one syllable. What about these names? Tammy, Jose, Jamal. How many times did your mouth move then? Twice, right? So there's two syllables. What about these words? Jennifer, Jeremy, Anita. How many times did your mouth move there? Three times. So that means those names have three syllables. So before we start identifying syllable types, we also need to understand what the term accent means. An understanding accent is helpful in determining the pronunciation of vowels. Accent is the stress or emphasis on one syllable in a word. The accented part or tone is spoken louder, longer, or in a higher tone. For example, when I say Tammy, the first syllable Tam is accented. And an accented syllable, your mouth also opens wider. So let's learn about syllable types. So all these words have something in common. What do you notice? What's similar about all these words? What pattern do you see? So did you notice that each word has one vowel and all of these words and with are more consonants? Now these syllables are called closed syllables. And it's called a closed syllable because they end in a consonant, and consonants close your mouth. Now, knowing that this syllable is closed helps you know that the vowel sound is going to make the short sound. For example, the a as in hat, the e in mend, the i in hip, the a in got, and the a uh in mud. And that code marking that you see, that's just simply a breathe, and a breathe indicates a short vowel sound. Now take a look at all these words. What do you notice that's similar about all these words? What's the pattern here? Well, did you notice that they all end in one vowel? And all of these words are one syllable, and that means that they're all accented. So words that end in one vowel that are accented, these are called open syllables. And they're open syllables because vowels open your mouth. Now, these vowels are pronounced with a long vowel sound, as in e and he, o and go, i and hi, e and me, and i and fly. And this code marking, that long line, is called a macron, and that indicates a long vowel sound. So to reinforce the concepts of open and closed syllables, an activity that you can do is to have your children or your students practice sorting syllables. So let's look at each syllable. Let's, and tell me what syllable type you think this is and why. So if we look at this first syllable, it ends in what? One vowel, okay? And so if it ends in one vowel, then it's just gonna be open or closed going to be open, okay? So if this is an open syllable, then that vowel E is going to say E, the long vowel sound. So let's look at this next syllable, okay? What do you notice about this? What's the pattern here? It has one vowel, but it ends in a consonant. And if it ends in a consonant with one vowel, then that's going to be a closed syllable. And that means that the vowel will be short, so the A will say ah. OK, 
okay, I want you to do this next one yourself. Did you come up with this? That it's an open syllable. Why? Because it ends in one vowel, and that O will say O because open syllables are long vowel sounds. What about this word? So this word ends in two consonants, and it is a closed syllable. And if it's a closed syllable, the vowel will be short, so that A will make its short sound. So here are some closed syllables. Now, I want you to look at this set of words, and I want you to compare it. Now, they look like closed syllables, don't they? But they're not. And that's because these vowels are followed by the consonant R. And what that consonant R does is it kind of manipulates and it controls that vowel sound to say something very unexpected. So these sets of words are called vowel R or R controlled syllables. So students have to learn each vowel R combination individually. Consistently, ER, IR, and UR are all going to be pronounced ER. Now, the combination AR says R in an accented syllable, like artist, or far, but in an unaccented syllable, like dollar, or collar, that AR is going to be pronounced ER. Combination OR is going to say OR in an accented syllable, like corn or order, but in an unaccented syllable, OR is going to be pronounced ER, like in doctor and major. So let's sort these syllables. What's going to be a vowel R and what's going to be a closed syllable? Ready? What do you think? It's going to be a vowel R syllable. Why? Because there's an R after the vowel. So that means the syllable is a vowel R syllable. The vowel makes an unexpected sound. It's going to say R. The word is star. So take a minute and see if you can identify what syllable types these three words are. Did you come up with this? So for more information regarding the other three syllable types, please refer to your handout. So to help beginning and struggling readers perceive where longer words divide, we have to teach them another reliable strategy regarding structure of words. And this is called syllable division patterns. Now there are four major syllable division patterns called VCCV, VCV, VCCCV, or VV. The V stands for vowel and the C stands for consonant. And we're going to be talking about two of these syllable division patterns today. So here are the steps of syllable division. Now regardless of the pattern, if it's VCCV or VV, all the syllable division types follow these seven steps. So the first thing that you're going to do when you see a longer word is you're going to see if you can find where those affixes are. And that's going to be suffixes or prefixes. Why? Why is it important to recognize prefixes and suffixes? Well, when you see a long word, well, you can feel helplessness, right? But if you know about the word parts and they can see this long word and go, wait a minute, I see a suffix less and I see the suffix ness. And when you box those two suffixes off, it's easier to identify and read the smaller base word. Now, we're not going to get into morphology in this lecture, but in addition to teaching students to recognize suffixes and prefixes, we also want students to understand the meaning of these suffixes and prefixes because that can also aid with understanding of the meaning of the derivative or the word. So, students are going to identify any affixes that they see, either at the beginning or the end of the word. Then they're going to count the sounded vowels. Then they're going to count the consonants between the sounded vowels, then they're going to divide the word, then they're going to accent the first syllable, then they're going to identify the syllable type, then they're going to read each syllable, and then they're going to read the whole word. So let's practice these steps. So here's how you might introduce this concept to students. When you see a long word, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look for prefixes and suffixes. Well, I don't see any in this word. 
So the next thing I need to do is I need to count where my sounded vowels are. And sounded just means the vowels that are going to make a sound. For example, if you have an E at the end of the word, we know that E is silent, so we wouldn't count that. So if I look at my sounded vowels in this word, I can see that there are two, right? A and I. Now, count the number of consonants that are in between. And there are two consonants, right, between those two vowels. So this is called the VCCV pattern, or the vowel consonant consonant vowel pattern. Now, in a VCCV pattern, the majority of the time, the word is going to divide between the two consonants. So English words usually accent on the first syllable, so we're going to place an accent mark by the first syllable. So now let's think about these syllable types so we can know what the vowels are gonna say. So if I look at that first syllable, N-A-P, is that an open, is that closed, is that vowel R? It's closed, right? And because it's closed, I know that vowel is going to be short and they're gonna say A. Ah. So that first syllable is nap. Look at that second syllable. What syllable type is that second syllable? That is also a closed syllable, so that I is going to be short and that I is going to make the is sound, so that says kin. So then we put this together and we have the word napkin. So let's use what we know about syllable division to look at another common syllable division pattern. And this is VCV or vowel consonant vowel. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look for any prefixes or suffixes. So then we're going to count the sounded vowels and we can see that there's an A and an I. So how many consonants are between these two vowels? There's only one. When there's only one consonant between the two vowels, again, this pattern is called vowel consonant vowel. The most common way to divide is before the consonant, and we're also going to accent the first syllable. So what syllable type is this first syllable? It's open, right, because it ends in one vowel. And so that means our A is going to say A. So that first syllable is BE. Look at that second syllable. That's closed. So that I is going to be short and that I will say I. So that syllable is sick. And if we put this together, the word is basic. So let's practice identifying syllable division patterns. So look at this word. How many sounded vowels does it have? Two. Now how many consonants are in between? Two. So this pattern would be vowel consonant consonant vowel. So I want you to take a minute and see if you can identify the other syllable division patterns for these three other words. Did you come up with this? So for more information regarding the other syllable division patterns, please refer to your handout. So to recap, a skilled reader can recognize words on a printed page quickly. If there's a word that a reader doesn't know, then he or she can sound it out using their knowledge of sound symbol correspondence or maybe even structural analysis. But if for some reason the reader cannot decipher the word, then he or she's going to use context. And context is the last strategy, believe it or not, that a skilled reader uses. Young and poor readers often you overuse context and that can lead to guessing and that can negatively impact your comprehension. When using context, a skilled reader uses the meanings of the words that surround that unfamiliar word to determine what is that unfamiliar word. But in order to use context effectively, you have to have a large vocabulary and you have to have world knowledge. So let's practice this. So I want you to read this passage and I want you to fill in the blanks with the missing words. Were you able to guess the words correctly? Probably because you've got the necessary vocabulary and you've got background knowledge to help you use context to fill in the missing words. All right, I want you to do the same thing again. I'm going to show you a passage and I want you to fill in the missing words. Ready? Read. Did you come up with this? So why did you struggle? Probably because unless you know statistics really, really well, this is going to be a challenge. You don't have the academic vocabulary and you may not have the background knowledge in order to use context effectively. 
So if a reader doesn't have those prerequisite skills, that, that vocabulary, that adequate background knowledge, it's so difficult to use context to accurately predict an unfamiliar word. And if your guess is close, then that's fabulous because it's not going to impair your comprehension. But if your guess is not accurate, there are going to be serious consequences when it comes to comprehension. So I want you to consider this. Only one out of every four words is predictable. And content words, those words that you see most often in science and social studies, those words are only predictable 10% of the time. So using context is not a very, very reliable strategy for figuring out an unfamiliar word. So when we approach reading instruction, it's best to use a synthetic approach and an analytic approach. So synthetic phonics instruction is just, that's reading. It's putting the parts together to create whole words, phrases, and sentences like k, a, t, blended together makes the word cat. Analytic phonics instruction is spelling, and that's when we're taking the whole apart to identify the individual parts. That's phoneme segmentation, like cat can be segmented into k, a, t, and both Synthetic and analytic phonics, both decoding and spelling, they're both necessary to begin the process of retaining how to read a word and also how to spell a word. So learning to decode and learning how to spell, they rely on the same foundational skills, but those skills are used in different ways. So when you're decoding, what you're simply doing is you're translating that grapheme or symbol into its phoneme or sound. But when you're spelling, it's a purely auditory process. The speller has to be able to hear that phoneme and then know what grapheme that represents that sound. So spelling and decoding reinforce each other. When readers practice spelling words they read and read words they spell, it reinforces the patterns in the language and it reinforces the pronunciation, which ultimately builds instant letter recognition, which again, is the goal of decoding. So for example, if students read this word dog, then what you wanna ask them next is, well, let's spell the word we just read. So the word was dog, let's unblend it. D -a -g. Now tell me what will spell each sound. And then you can write D-O-G and then have the student practice read the word again. So dog, is a regular word. And believe it or not, the majority of words in the English language are regular and follow reliable patterns. So we can sound them out. That's what a regular word is, is that it follows the regular reliable pattern. We can sound those words out and words like dog and cat and even larger words like fantastic, that's regular too. Irregular words are words that don't follow reliable, frequently occurring patterns. We can't sound them out. You just have to memorize them. And an important thing to remember about irregular words for reading is it's usually not the whole part of the word is irregular. It's just one small aspect of it that's typically irregular. So students can use the regular parts of the word to build their instant word recognition. And the best way to learn irregular words is to drill them. And drill is not a dirty word. Again, it's that repeated exposure that's going to help build them into that instant memory. So what you can do is you can make your own word cards. And words that are easy to read that follow those reliable patterns, put them on green cards because green means go. Go ahead and you can read this word. However, if you have a word that's irregular, there's something that's just not, that doesn't follow that pattern, then put them on a red card and maybe clip the corner off to give it an irregular shape. And this just means that I need to stop. This word can't be sounded out. I'm gonna have to know something that's different about this particular pattern. On the back end of an irregular word, one thing you can do is put a spelling pronunciation on the back of it, or you might just simply circle the part of the word that is irregular. So that concludes my presentation today, and I wanna thank you so much for joining me and learning a little bit more about how phonology and phonics can help students become successful readers. Thank you.